Man, it's so good to be here today. And I just want to extend a warm welcome to everyone, whether you're in person today, whether you are online today. It is so good to be in God's house this morning. And today we continue our series called Deliver Us. As we look at this beautiful story of the Exodus and God bringing his people out of uh, Egypt into uh, the, the land that he has promised them, out of the bondage of slavery and captivity, we are grateful for that today. And this morning, as we look at this story of Moses found in the book of Exodus, right, we're going to be looking at this um, Again, what it means for God to be faithful, these three key components. We're looking at the faithfulness of God to his people in the midst of their struggles. We're looking at how God's people struggle to be with God and and to celebrate and give thanks and trust in God, even in the most difficult situations, so that they may find a deliverer and see the salvation that is coming their way, the salvation who is ultimately in Jesus. And so we are thankful for that today. Now, today's message is a culmination, if you will, as Moses and Pharaoh do battle at the Red Sea. And so today, we're going to use this story to look at three things. And I want to walk you through three things this morning. Number one is this. Who are the enemies of God? When we really think deeply about who is it that stands in opposition to our God, Who stands in opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ? And with that in mind, how then does God go about defeating his enemies? And then ultimately, what is the victory response? How do God's people respond when God is victorious? What do we do? So let's pray, and then we'll dive into those three questions this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have victory over your enemies, that victory is in Jesus. And I celebrate that. I give thanks for that. We rejoice in it. And every day we come before you giving praise for the Christus victor, Christ's victory over sin, death, and the devil. We are grateful for that today. So open up our hearts to hear your word. Open up our minds to see your truth. Open up our lives to receive your grace. In your name we pray, and we all said together, church, amen, amen, amen. Let me do a quick recap this morning because of this beautiful story that we are following through, right? We know that God's people have been living in bondage, living in slavery to the captivity of Pharaoh, and have been working in just dreaded conditions. And so they cry out for deliverance to God. They're asking the Lord to rescue, save, and deliver them. And so God calls up his prophet Moses to be an agent of that deliverance. In fact, he says, Moses, you will be to Pharaoh as God is. And Aaron, you will be my prophet. Pharaoh then, as in this confrontational battle, we see back and forth with the Lord. And we have these ten horrific plagues that devastate and destroy all of Egypt. But yet God is faithful and good to his people. And he delivers them in the land of Goshen. He, he, he protects them from darkness. He protects them from flies. He protects them from locusts, boils, and all the rest. Culminating in that final event, the death of the firstborn. Where God's angel of death passes through the cities and the walls and the homes. And yet... Those who are covered by the blood of the Lamb are protected. As we hear the rallying cry, let my people go, God says. So broken and defeated, Pharaoh releases God's people to go and serve their God and worship him on the holy mountain. And that's where our story picks up today. In Exodus chapter 13, beginning at verse 17. So if you got your Bibles, you want to go to Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, let's do that today. I'm also going to put it up for on the, on the screen for you. Exodus chapter 13, beginning at verse 17. Let's look at it together. When Pharaoh let the people go, God led the people around by the way of the wilderness towards the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt, and watch this. They were equipped for what? Say it with me, church. Battle. They were equipped 
for battle. And so they moved on from Succoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. Let me put a map up for you just so you can see this just briefly. Ramses and Pithom, those are the two cities in which they built the Israelites. Succoth is the place that they will travel to, and the wilderness is where they will wander for 40 years. We don't know the exact location of Mount Sinai, but the traditional location is at the bottom of the Sinai Peninsula. This is the area that we are talking about. But the key phrase that we're going to focus on today is, they were equipped for battle. They were equipped for battle. Now, maybe they had swords, and maybe they had spears, and maybe they had shields. That is certainly a possibility. But on a deeper level, they were equipped for battle. Why? Because the presence of the Lord was with them. The presence of the Lord was with them. Let's go to Exodus chapter 13, verse 21. And the Lord went before them day by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. By night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they may travel by day and by night. And the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. What an incredible image to wonder. I want you to think about what that image looks like. Fire on one side by night, a pillar of cloud during the day, each a visible representation. God is with you, right? Why do so many people wear a cross necklace? To remind us that God is with us. Why do we memorize the scriptures? So that we remember that God is with us and dwells in us. Why do we remember our baptism daily? To remember that God is with us. Here are these Hebrews, these Israelites, and they have a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, and they travel with the Lord. The Lord's presence and leadership never departed from the people. See, if you're going to do any kind of battle, right, whether you're battling an addiction, whether you're fighting injustice, whether you have a physical enemy that you are doing battle with, or maybe you simply are struggling with your personal demons. Maybe you're battling a sickness or disease. Whatever battle that you personally are engaged in, the two things that you absolutely want before you go into battle is this. I want the presence of the Lord, and I want the leadership of the Lord. I want God's eternal presence to be upon my life day in and day out, knowing that my God is with me, and I want his leadership. I want him to lead the way. I know. I, I mean, I'm just telling you, man, I, I have to have God's leadership. Otherwise, I will make bad decisions. I will turn inward and be selfish. I will do the things that I want and not the things that God wants. If it is not for the Lord, man, oh, heaven for Betsy, right? We want the leadership of the God. We want the leadership of the creator of the universe, whose all wisdom is all powerful and he is all knowing, right? Because when it comes to God, and his people, there are always enemies. So who are they? Who are the enemies of God? Let's jump over to Exodus 14, verse 5. Let's find out together. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people. And here's what they said. What is this we've done? We've let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot and he took his army with him and he took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers all over them and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. Now, When you look at Pharaoh, who is the epitome of an enemy of God, when you look at the entire Exodus narrative, but especially here in chapter 14, 
you discover three characteristics of someone who is an enemy of God. When you're trying to really wrestle with who is an enemy of God, here are the three characteristics we look for. Number one, their mind is against God. Their mind is against God. Remember that great scene between Peter and Jesus? When Peter looks at Jesus, Jesus has just told Peter that you're going to be the rock in which I build my church, but I must suffer, die, be buried, and rise in the third day. And Peter looks at Jesus and says, never, Lord. That's never going to happen. Jesus looks at Peter and he says, what? Y'all know it. Get behind me what? Satan. There's no greater enemy than Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You're an enemy. Why? Because your mind is in the wrong place. See, an enemy of God has their mind against God. An enemy of God, as we see in Pharaoh, their heart is set against God. Their heart is driven either by selfishness or hardness or their own agenda. Their heart is not compelled to love and be compassionate and graceful and merciful like the Lord. And their actions go against the will of God. That's an enemy of God. Now, I'm going to pause here for a moment. Because sometimes we look in the mirror and what we see is the enemy. Sometimes we have to look in the mirror and go, my mind is not set on the things of God. My heart is not set on the things of God. And because my mind and my heart is not set on the things of God, guess what? Neither are my actions. And so what we ultimately see is, yes, there are enemies out there, but sometimes the greatest enemy of God is the one that you look at in the mirror. Our mind, our heart, our actions. When we think about the enemies of God in today's world, we want to look for those who embody these three same characteristics. So take a moment then, and let's look at who God identifies as his enemies throughout this scripture. I'm going to give you five of them. Here's the five enemies that are in the scriptures. Number one, Satan and his demonic realm, right? Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark and world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Who is our enemy? Satan. Peter describes it this way. He says, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to what? Devour. Right? That's number one. Number two, friends of this world. Friends of this world. Jesus' half-brother James describes it this way. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means you're an enemy against God? Did you hear that question? He said, when you embrace a friendship of the world, you're, you're friend to the ideology of the world, you're friend to the culture of the world, you're friend to the movement of the world, and it's not, your, your eyes are set on things below and not things above, guess what you have become? You have become an enemy of God. And therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world, he says, becomes an enemy of God. Paul puts it in Philippians this way. For as often as I have told you before, and now I tell you again, even with tears, he's shedding tears over this fact, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set, watch this, on earthly things. They're just fixated on the world. They're not fixated on Jesus. Number three, false prophets and teachers. We looked at this a lot in the book of Galatians, right? Paul says, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, and they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. John describes it this way when he says, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus as the Christ are coming in the flesh and they've gone out into the world. And any such person who is a deceiver or an antichrist, 
You know, an antichrist is just somebody who is against Christ. The message is against the gospel, right? There are false prophets and false teachers who set themselves up against Jesus. Number four, death itself. Death itself. Paul tells in that beautiful chapter on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where he says, for Jesus must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, right? Submitted, right? All enemies come bow before Jesus. The last enemy to be de destroyed is what? Death. Death is the last enemy to be destroyed. And then finally, the enemy that we struggle with more than anything else is our sinful flesh. And Paul brings this to life in, in, in Romans chapter 7 when he says these words. And, man, they're, they're, they're hard to sometimes understand, but they're so true. He says, listen, I don't get me. I don't get my own actions. I do what I want, and then I do the very thing that I hate. So now it's no longer I who do it, but it's the sin that dwells in, within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do is right. Can anybody agree with this? I have the desire to do it right, but sometimes I just don't do it. There's things I know that are good, and I do what is selfish. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but instead the evil that is in my flesh. That's what I keep on doing. Can I get an amen? Come on, y'all. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? We all got those sins that just keep popping up year after year, day after day, week after week, month after month. Now, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me, right? Those are the enemies of God. And sometimes, again, the greatest enemy is the one looking in the mirror. See, just as Pharaoh stood before Moses as an enemy ready to do battle, these five enemies are always ready to do battle. And they wage a battle for your soul so that you discard Jesus. And the battle plan is simple. I call it the three Ds of spiritual warfare. They're real simple. Number one, create discouragement. Just become discouraged as a believer. Just stop wanting to follow Jesus. Just stop wanting to live for him. Just stop wanting to be salt and light. Just stop wanting to read your Bible. Just stop wanting to pray. You just get discouraged because you believe the world is going to hell. Nothing is good. Jesus is powerless, and you just get discouraged. The second is division. One of the things Satan loves is the fact that the body of Christ is so divided. So divided. Divided between denominations, divided between races, divided between ideologies and beliefs, Catholics and Protestants, Orthodox and, and everything else. We're so divided. And then doubt, which I think we've spent some time on here. Now, when we know who the enemy is, though, through both his characteristics and his identification and his methods, we need to now look at how does God defeat his enemies? So let's go back to the book of Exodus for a moment. Exodus chapter 14, beginning at verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out the Lord, and they said to Moses, it is because there's no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Is it not this that we said to you? Just leave us alone so that we may serve the Egyptians. It would be better to serve the Egyptians than to do what? Die in the wilderness. Whew. We need to recognize, first of all, that enemies can be terrifying. Amen? They can bring fear to our hearts. And when we have fear in our hearts, what do we do? We go to the worst case scenarios. Fear can cause you to lose perspective. For not, Think about this. For nine months, God protected the people of God against the devastating plagues of Egypt. For nine months, as Egypt was ravaged, Goshen was saved. The Israelites were covered under the protective hand of the Lamb's blood. And yet they have this moment of fear. 
The enemy is in sight. Their fear caused them to lose sight of the fact that Yahweh is more powerful than anyone else. That Yahweh has resoundly defeated Pharaoh again and again and his pantheon of false gods. And yet, they were afraid that they would die in the wilderness. And let's be honest, so do we, right? God can show his faithfulness again and again and again. And yet when fear starts to creep up in the soul, how many of us does it cause us to lose sight of God? Just give me a thumbs up. If fear causes you at times to lose sight of God and his goodness, his faithfulness, his protection, his beauty, his grace, his forgiveness, his love, his power, it happens again and again and again. So we got to go back to Yahweh for a moment and see how he fights for his people. In verse 13 it says, And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm. Can we all say that together? Fear not, stand firm. Again throughout the scriptures. Fear not, stand firm. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. I think sometimes we forget this. We got these battles in our lives, and we're trying to do all the fighting. And God says to you and to me, don't forget, I will fight for you. I will fight for your marriage. I will fight for your kids. I will fight for your well-being. I will fight for your life. I will fight for your salvation. I will fight for you. Now, look what he says there, though, because this is where we get our problems so often. He says, you only have to be silent. Just stop talking for a little bit and let God do what God does best. Fear not. Stand firm. The Lord will fight for you. Just be silent. And what happens next is quite remarkable. The Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. Can you imagine Moses standing there? He's in the middle of the water. His staff is raised. His, the hands are, are, are neck are, are out, stretched wide, right? Can you just imagine that moment? Go ahead and lean. Put, yeah, there we go. The people of Israel, just imagine as I read these words, this scene on the screen. Lift up your staff. Stretch out your hand over the sea. Divide it. That the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will come after you. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his warriors, his chariots, his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And then something amazing happens. Watch this. Then the angel of God, who is going before the host of Israel. That means the people of God, the accompaniment, right? The angel moved. Now, don't, don't, I, man, this blew me away when I was reading this again yesterday. Watch this. The angel of God moved and he went behind them. And the pillar cloud, what did it do? It moved and it stood behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved and stood behind them, coming between who? Coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud in the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Can you visualize the moment? See, God, when he fights for you, stands between you And the enemy. He moves, just watch this, behind you. When the enemy is pursuing you, he moves behind you. He stands between you and the enemy. He is your protection, your guard, your refuge, your strength. He stands to protect his people and fight for his people. It's why in Ephesians 6, God invites us to take up the full armor of God so that he can 
When you put that breastplate of righteousness on, that helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the shield of truth, what is happening? God is now standing between you and your enemies. So when the fiery darts of the devil come your way, you are protected because you are covered in Jesus. You are, God is between you and your enemy. And then Moses, I love this scene. This is from the Charlton Huston film, right? Then Moses stretched out of his hand over the sea. And the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind and all night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground. And the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. And my favorite confirmation question ever was, Pastor, could they see the fish? (laughs) The Egyptians then, they pursued. They went in after them into the midst of the sea. All of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces. Watch this. And they threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Church, please don't ever forget that every day of your life, the Lord is fighting for you. You do not stand alone in battle. You don't go out day at your work, when you're with family, when you're dealing with your enemies. Church, the devil wants you to think you're all on your own. Jesus wants to know. He fights for you. He is there with you. And then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. You can you imagine being those Egyptians in the water, driving those chariots clogged with mud, horses trying to make their way through, and then all of a sudden the water comes crashing down. The waters cover the chariots and all the host of Pharaoh that followed into the sea, and not one of them remained. But the people of God walked on the dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And then here's the key moment. Thus, the Lord saved Israel that day from the hands of the Egyptians. God promised them that he would deliver them from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, and he did exactly that. The Lord saved Israel. And the beauty of this is that 1,500 years later, God will fulfill another promise that he made to his people, a promise that he made from the beginning of creation to send a Messiah one who would rescue and deliver God's people from the bondage of sin, death, suffering, and the world. In fact, he tells a newly married husband by the name of Joseph that his wife will have a son, and his son's name will be what? Say it with me, church, Jesus. And why did they name him Jesus? Because Jesus will save his people from their sins. The Lord saved Moses and the Egyptian and the Israelites from the Egyptians and now God comes to you and me through Christ and he saves us from our enemies. Jesus comes to us to save his people from their sins. Jesus comes to us not with plagues like locusts and blood and darkness. Instead, Jesus comes to announce the good news to the poor. He comes to proclaim liberty the captives, give sight to the blind, bring freedom to the oppressed, and declare the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus saves us by defeating our enemies once for all. Satan, he kicks out forever to be in bondage in hell. Death is robbed of its power. The world is overcome. False prophets are silent. But the final enemy which is man and woman, himself and herself, our sinful flesh. 
God doesn't simply want to defeat that enemy. God, through Jesus, wants to reconcile that enemy. God wants to take this enemy and turn this enemy into a friend so that on Sundays we can sing what a friend we have in Jesus. God wants to show mercy and grace and forgiveness to his enemies so that they can now become his children. God wants to bring joy and life to all who believe so that he doesn't have to condemn us but save us. As Paul so clearly says in Romans 5, I want to end with this. But God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, me, you, everybody in this room. Since therefore we've now been justified his blood, how much more will we be what? Say with me, church. Saved. Right? We'll be saved from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, this is so hard to believe and so hard to fully trust in. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. How much more now are we reconciled to be saved by his life? You know, when I was in college, it was the first time I came across this passage from Romans 5 just kind of on my own. I'm sure I heard it in church on one Sunday, but actually reading my Bible on my own, sitting there thinking about what God had just said. See, all the way up to college, probably 18, 19, 20 years old, if you had asked me, Dave, are you an enemy of God? I'd go, that's crazy. That's crazy talk. I grew up in the church. I love Jesus. I'm here to serve and become a pastor. What do you mean I'm an enemy of God? Enemy of God are like people like Pharaoh, like Hitler, like terrible, horrible, no good, bad people. I never once fully grasped that I was an enemy of God. That without Jesus in my life, without the forgiveness of sins that he had won, without being covered in his righteousness, without being born again in his name, without being washed in the waters of baptism, I was an enemy of God. That my life stood in opposition to his righteousness, his goodness, his mercy, and his grace. I always imagined that God's enemies were people like Pharaoh and what I call the real baddies of the world. But I had to look in the mirror and see myself. And maybe you do too. Maybe we all do. Because then we can grab a hold of the gospel. That Jesus has given me the forgiveness of sins and so has he given it to you. That you and I are completely and fully reconciled to God because of Jesus. That's why we call it good news. And this good news of God's victory over his enemies over me, always has the same response. Exodus 14, verse 30 says this. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. And so what happened? The people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord. When you discover God's victory over our enemies, his enemies, you, May you fear the Lord, which means to honor, respect, praise, and glorify. May you believe in him with all your heart, mind, and soul. Trust him for everything because of Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we all say together, church, amen. Let's